This is CBC Here and Now. I've been in lockup now for five year, for five bad days their last week and this for 14. They do meet the definition of fitness. Um, they remain uh, remarkably low functioning and have a very difficult time you know, finding their way through the court system without assistance. If you don't show up in court, you miss your court date, you go to jail. This St. John's panhandler stuck in a cycle of court cases that he can't even remember. What is the bar for being fit to stand trial? Good evening and welcome to Here and Now. I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes. Well, this week we've talked a lot about the trial of Graham Vitch, the unfortunate case of a schizophrenic teen who killed his mother's partner during a delusional episode. Now, some say his case shines a light on just how the justice, justice system rather is not equipped to deal with people who happen to have severe mental illnesses. And as Ryan Cook reports, those concerns go far beyond just Graham Vitch. High-profile cases have dominated the news in the last few years. Graham Vitch found not criminally responsible for killing David Collins with a hammer. And Norris, same weapon, same result. Nicholas Lehman was found not criminally responsible for nearly killing a little boy in a random attack. But for every killer with an NCR verdict, there's dozens of people with questionable mental capacity floundering through the court system for petty crimes. I'd say it's at least once or twice a week we encounter someone who, at least at the initial uh, interaction, there's some question as to whether they truly appreciate what's going on. Tim O'Brien has perhaps the most frustrating job in the legal profession, duty counsel for bail court, the first point of contact for people facing a judge for the first time, people like Eugene Hines. I've been in lockup now for five years, for five bad days their last week, and this for court date. Lock up for five days. Five days. This is Eugene Hines' list of charges. There's a lot. 46 in St. John's, five more in Grand Falls, Windsor. All minor, none violent. He's a panhandler downtown, a fixture on Water Street. But he has problems with his memory, his mental capacity, and he ends up forgetting his court dates. When that happens, a judge issues a warrant for his arrest. Police officers pick him up and hold him for the night. He's released from bail court the next morning and given another court date. If he forgets that court date, it starts all over again. You see them coming back and back and back again. The list of charges grows and eventually people are putting themselves in a situation where, you know, if it's a first offense, um, they may be looking at, you know, um, no serious consequences um, in terms of sentence. But then if they miss enough court dates and, you know, breach other minor conditions that eventually um, snowballs into a situation where they're going to jail. We ran into Hines one day last week and mentioned that he was due in court the next day. He had no idea until I showed him on the docket. The next day Hines showed up in court. He pleaded guilty to trespassing. The rest of his charges were dropped. His seven minor charges had snowballed into 46 and in the end they really meant nothing. So think of all the resources that go into that, the judges, the lawyers, the court staff, police, and sheriffs. And that's all for just one case. O'Brien says part of the problem is how people are found fit to stand trial. If you say you understand what's happening, you meet the requirements. The province is taking a positive step on this. In the fall, they'll reintroduce a bail supervision program, which was cut under the previous PC government. It'll be a person's job to make sure that somebody like Eugene Hines shows up to court on time and follows his conditions. It's an investment that the province hopes will save money in the long term. Hines, meanwhile, has two court appearances left until his entire legal mess is over, if he can remember to attend them. Ryan Cook, CBC News, St. John's. The Premier pushed back today against critics who say he hasn't been optimistic enough about the potential at Muskrat Falls. He was on the stand at the inquiry into the hydro project today. He's the final person to testify in this phase of the inquiry. Here now's Peter Cowan joins us live from the newsroom tonight. So Peter, what did the Premier say? 
Carolyn, this was the Premier's second day on the stand, and he was facing cross-examination from Tommy Williams, who's representing his better-known brother, former Premier Danny Williams, along with other government officials. And what Tommy Williams was saying to the Premier was, hasn't he just not been optimistic enough about the future? There's going to be more oil and gas development, more money that can be used to offset rates. But the Premier pushed back from that today, in fact, saying that the issue is you can have all, all, all the optimism you want, but you need money now in order to keep rates from doubling. And here's how that exchange went today at the inquiry. There is hope that we will be able to use those type of revenues to offset expenses with respect to this project. I don't deposit optimism in the bank account of this province. We build and support and market this province, yes, on a lot of optimism that we want to support with the marketing this province to our offshore. But this project was never started to take dividends from our offshore. This was supposed to be self-supporting. Nowhere in the plan in the early days when this was sold to the people of the province were they expecting a rate mitigation plan of over $200 million in dividends that would have to come from year one. Now, the Premier also faced questions today about capping wetlands at Muskrat Falls. The plan was to do that to reduce the amount of methyl mercury released and ending up downstream. But that didn't happen. Why? Well, they simply ran out of time and they didn't get to it soon enough. The Premier insists today that he really wanted to do this, but at the same time, he also mentioned it turns out it wouldn't actually have had the benefit that a lot of people think it would. The evidence today doesn't support wetland capping, but for me it was the intangible benefits mm -hmm. in actually getting this wetland capping done. It was the very last witness in phase two of the inquiry and it's been a marathon. After reviewing more than six million documents, so far there have been more than 4,000 exhibits entered. And that's just, and in just phase two, the inquiry has heard from more than 80 people What's the bill? Well, as of the end of March, so far this inquiry has cost more than $11 million. And there's more of this to come. Phase 3 is going to get underway in uh, just about a week and a half. It's going to look at the future. What happens in 2041 when the Churchill Falls Agreement ends and there's access to more power? And what happens or what should happen when the province tries to take on another mod me mega project again? Reporting live from the newsroom, I'm Peter Cowan for Hearing Now. Well, Ashley isn't in the studio with us tonight. No, so uh, just where is she? You can take a look. Um, I'm out and about. Uh, I am currently at the Perchance Outdoor Theater in Cupids, where they are rehearsing behind me for The Servant of Two Masters, which opens on July 20th. And uh, we're going to talk a little bit about how weather plays a role into this. We'll talk to the director, and you'll get a little bit of a sneak peek as to what you're going to see. But I've been alluding to the fact that it's going to warm up this weekend to be or not to be sunny. That is the question. I'll have all those details coming up. All right, we'll check back in with Ashley uh, later. Now, in other news, the family of a man who went missing in Northwest River last summer is resuming their search to find him. 43-year-old Luke Cooper was paddling in the area when it is believed that his canoe capsized. A family, the community, and the RCMP searched for him, but they found nothing. While Cooper is presumed dead, his body was never recovered. The family is now back putting up posters, searching the water as well as the land, and they're also asking anybody with any possible information about the morning Cooper disappeared to please get in touch with them. Well, it's important this year to bring it back up again because we want to get volunteers um, to get out on the 13th and 14th to search again. And because we don't forget, my uncle's still out there. My mom still has sleepless nights waiting for him to come home. So, you know, whatever help we can get to get him back. We searched the water. Things didn't add up quite, so we're not sure if he's in the water. And if he was, I don't think that he just drowned where they said he drowned. Um, so, I mean, the water searches are still good. It's still good for people to be out looking in the water. But also, if people see disturbed ground, um, to report it to preferably my family. Um, yeah, because we don't really have that much support from the police, and it's hard. 
A 23-year-old man has been charged for allegedly shooting at a house and a car at Lidstone Crescent in Mount Pearl earlier this week. The RNC says the man was arrested the next day but charged this afternoon. He's in custody, accused of firearms-related offenses as well as mischief. Police say people were at home at the time but nobody was injured. Investigators did not believe it was a random act. The CNLOPB has given Husky Energy permission to install a replacement subsea flow line connector at its South White Rose Drill Center. The work is set to start this weekend. In November, a flow line connector near the drill center failed, leading to the biggest oil spill in this province's history. Husky plugged the flow line and recovered the faulty connector. The new part has a higher load capacity than the one which failed last year. Husky says the risk is low, but the work could release residual oil trapped in the plugs. And if that happens, Husky says there will be measures in place to deal with it quickly. Once the new part is installed, the company will report back to the CNLOPB before testing the system. The work is weather dependent and is expected to take about two weeks. The RNC made a dump run in St. John's yesterday looking for trash transgressions. Officers ended up handing out 72 tickets to people who didn't have their loads covered up. They also impounded two cars and issued five vehicle inspection notices. Well, it turns out Mount Pearl's new anthem isn't only stuck in the heads of people here. It's also caught the attention of Ad Week magazine. Tony's a Zamboni driver. Better believe it. Business here is a big deal. Over 20 sport fields. Ad Week has about 6 million readers. It puts out an ad of the day profiling the best of the best in the industry. And this week it featured Mount Pearl right next to ads for Apple and Nike. The article has the headline, this tiny Canadian town known for nothing playfully disses itself in rap video. The magazine praises the video for highlighting the perks of Mount Pearl in a self-deprecating style. So far, the Mount Pearl music video has racked up about 100,000 views online. It's hard to look at these clusters of stars without your imagination going wild, at least for me anyway. The perfect spot to let his mind race. We'll meet the man who built his very own observatory. That's coming up.
Well, welcome back. Friday, of course, a time when people are making plans. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, and Ashley Brawweiler is out in beautiful Cupid's tonight at Perchance Theatre. Uh, so, Ashley, what's on the go out there? Mm. Yeah, we're, uh, we're out here and they're doing a little bit of a rendition of, or not a little bit of a rendition, they are actually just uh, practicing for what's going to happen on July 20th, which is the opening of uh, the Masters of Two Servants. The Servant of Two Masters, Servant actually. Two. There you go. <laughs> Already got it wrong. Uh, so I'm here with the director, uh, Perry Schneiderman. Right. And uh, you are well known in the community for... Uh, Commedia dell'arte. Right, it's an Italian comedy, it's classical comedy, it's really from that sprang all kinds of famous duos like Laurel and Hardy, Abbott and Costello, The Honeymooners, Jackie Gleason, Art Carney, even The, the Simpsons, all those co comedic characters come from the ancient uh, Commedia dell'arte that's from the 17th, 18th century. Um, and it's a very physical comedy, it's very gestural. So we use masks or heightened makeup because it isn't like kitchen sink drama. It's not realistic. It's very flamboyant and very physicalized. So we hope the audience will come and enjoy the, the, the physical comedy. Jerry Lewis as well comes to mind. All those kind of physical comedians, the, the, the roots of that are with the Commedia dell'arte. That's where it started. And so the costumes are obviously uh, a big role. I actually mm -hmm. forgot it. Can someone bring me a, the mask over there? Because <laughs> I forgot the mask. So masks obviously play a big role or yeah, in what's going to happen. There we go. This is a mask here. Yeah, there are, there, are, there are a number of stock characters. Our central character is Truffle Dino, who's a Harlequin character, servant. He's always hungry. He's always manipulating, trying to get food, trying to get, get people to do things for him. He's a trickster. Um, and he's our central character, and he tries to serve two masters at the same time, as the title says. And he's got all kinds of ways of fooling them into thinking there's only one, he's only serving one of them. So we have all kinds of hijinks going through the play, and he's the main character. But there's a number of masked characters, which are stock characters from the Commedia. This is the doctor mask, okay. and he's a pedant. He's, a, he's the father of the, s his son is supposed to marry another character's daughter and he's a pedant he's a blowhard you know there are some politicians that come to mind <laughs> <laughs> when uh, when we think of the doctor and there's a few other characters like that and th what they do is they really help the actor really heighten the gesture and the vocal so that it is you're not watching a film you're not coming here to watch anything that could be reproduced in a movie it's very very theatrical it's very colorful the costumes are very colorful mm. almost circus like um and um, and there's a lot of uh, interaction between these many colorful characters so lots of business you'll see a little example of that with uh, when um, harlequino or truffle dino finally gets his master to order a meal because he's so hungry and so he calls out the the proprietor of the inn and they they talk about how you prepare a meal mm -hmm. and he's very particular about how you lay a table so it's one of the scenes in the play and that's the scene we're going to see in a little yeah. bit okay yeah. Uh -huh. so yeah so we're gonna we're gonna see <coughs> that uh a little bit later in the show but uh weather plays a, a pretty important role because we're in an outdoor yes, theater yes we have to keep our fingers crossed definitely do <laughs> uh but we're a couple of weeks away from that okay but yes. uh we're gonna talk about the weather for this weekend because we're in for some warm-up okay good so it's kind of chilly out here right now, too. So we'll take a look at uh, the current temperatures right now across the board. It's, uh, or at least what we saw this afternoon, 14 degrees for um, St. John's. And then we've got temperatures in the double digits for most of Central, 24 degrees for Badger, 23 for Deer Lake. And then you've got those temperatures again. There's that heat, 22 degrees in Lab City uh, this afternoon. Now currently we've dropped a little bit down to 13 degrees in St. John's, 20 for Corner Brook, and then similar temperature up through Happy Valley Goose Bay as well. Now, as far as uh, te our weather goes today, that low pressure system that has been over us for the last couple of days is finally moving off. We're still holding on to some cloud cover though uh, here on the Avalon, but that will clear out as we head through the overnight tonight. Those winds are going to stay light as well. So those temperatures actually quite nice, 10 degrees overnight for St. John, 17 for Port Basque and 12 uh, for Corner Brook overnight tonight, St. Anthony. 
sitting around 8 degrees as your overnight low. Uh, still looking at the risk of some thunderstorms, though, for Lab West. We so still have that in the forecast. 16 degrees should be your overnight low there. And then tomorrow, that heat continues to push a little bit further east. Now, as far as uh, how much sun we're going to see, likely going to be plenty of sunshine for most of the island with some cloudy periods. And then you can't rule out the chance of a few thunderstorms either. And uh, that's because we're going to see a little bit of a cold front push through. Here's your temperatures, though. 24 degrees for St. John's. Uh, some southerly winds, 15 to 20 kilometers per hour. That will be the high. We'll likely see a sea breeze kick in. So anywhere along the coast, those temperatures will drop. Still have that chance of some showers in for Clarenville, Marystown, 25 degrees as your afternoon high. And then heading towards uh, Grand Falls, Windsor, 30 degrees. Now it is going to be very humid through the afternoon. The south coast a little cooler, 18 degrees. But Twillingate should reach a high near 26 degrees. Again, I do have that slight, slight risk of thunderstorms in the forecast. It's still there, though. Uh, but most of the day should be a mix of sun and cloud. Along the west coast, though, as that cold front approaches, you will start to see that shower activity move in. 20 to 26 degrees is the afternoon high for you. Uh, a little cooler up through St. Anthony, but still in the teens at 14 degrees. And then uh, heading towards Happy Valley Goose Bay. Risk of thunderstorms there, even for southeastern portions of Labrador as well. Churchill Falls sitting around 21. And then Lab City sitting around 17. So tomorrow does look warm, a little bit unsettled, but overall an absolutely gorgeous day. And uh, we mentioned a little bit earlier that we're going to see a little bit of the play. And we'll have all of that coming up. Okay, uh, certainly the central character in our next story will like the forecast that Ashley gave with respect to the skies clearing up. Skipper Jim Gillard has expanded his horizons. The retired fisherman spent his entire life on the sea, but these days he's much more interested in those skies that Ashley was talking about. And his $50,000 front yard observatory is quite the sight. Here now is Garrett Barry got to look through the telescope himself, and he put together our next story. Built over 20 years, it's a lifelong dream turned reality, a place where passions thrive. It's all new territory, you know, when you look at it in the sky and it's hard to look at these clusters of stars without your imagination going wild, at least for me anyway, it's, the potential is enormous there. But still, some signs of the past. I took the same system that I used for pulling up the crab pots. In, in, in 1,200 feet of water. Skipper Jim was fascinated at an early age, and now, with kids shipped out, he's free to indulge. You know, it, it's sometimes it's hard to make a bit of money, but you know what? The, the key is uh, when you get it spent, <clears throat> if you're happy with what you got uh, for the money, then that's, that's all that matters. And speaking of history, it's everywhere here once you start to think about it. If you're looking at the Andromeda Galaxy, and then the, uh, and the photons of light that are actually hitting your eye lift the galaxy 2.3 million years ago and just impacted your eye. I'd love to be able to tell you exactly what I'm looking at through this machine, but midway through our interview, it started to rain. So Skipper Jim had to rush outside to close his observatory window. You never think it would, it would go from... from uh, Clear to rain, would you? <laughs> Life in Newfoundland and Labrador. But on those good days, you can really take advantage. He's up there a lot. Yeah, I say anywhere from, well, depends on the weather, like I said. Uh, four hours, six hours, could be longer. Anyways, you'll just have to trust me. The moon was bright and big. Sort of like this YouTube footage. Nothing I had ever seen before. You know, people come in here and, uh, you know, and uh, they got a bit of interest in astronomy. And uh, by the time they leave, uh, you know, they got a lot more, it seems like. Count me among the converts with a newfound appreciation for the mysteries of the night sky. Garrett Barry, CBC News, New World Island. Colorado selects from Victoria, the BC Hockey League, Alex Newhook. He played in BC, but he's from St. John's, drafted into the NHL first round. It was a big night two weeks ago, and it hasn't really slowed down since. He's home these days. My conversation with Alex right after the break.
It's been almost two decades since this province had a first round draft pick to the NHL. And that's my next guest, Alex Newhook. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I noticed you've got the, uh, the emblem of the team that drafted you. How did it feel when they, they said your name? Oh, it was crazy. It's, it's, uh, it's a feeling that's kind of built up, I think, my whole life so far to this point. Uh, a day I really looked forward to ever since I started playing. And for, you know, to hear my name called by Colorado, it was, uh, it was a special feeling, something I'll never forget. Okay, so before your life completely changes, you're home for a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, right? home for three weeks of summer, which is nice. Um, a little shorter than usual, but um, be able to take a little bit in and, and see my buddies and family for a bit, it's good. So what kind of reaction are you getting when you go around? Because obviously it's big news here. Uh, you're about to become a very famous man, if not already. H how are you making that adjustment? Yeah, it's, it's definitely different. I think, you know, once you're part of a team, once you're part of a, uh, a club there in the NHL, you carry that title with you around. And, you know, it's a pretty pretty close community here in St. John's, and that's what I tell people from home, that everyone in Newfoundland really, really pulls to each other. Everyone, you know, kind of seems like they know each other. Uh, so to come back and see everyone, they, they kind of treat me the same like I was, you know, years previous, and, and it's really nice that way. Now, you're a young guy. Uh, you're entering a field of work where there can be a lot of money made depending on what happens in your career. We always hear these people signing these mega contracts. So if you're one of those guys and you sign those contracts with all those zeros after it, how do you stay who you are? How do you not let that money change you? Yeah, I think it all comes back to who you are, you know, as a person and growing up and, and your roots, that kind of thing. Um, I, I think being from here and, and the family I was raised by, I think it's it's something that just, just comes to me. I don't think that's going to really change anything. Um, you know, it's obviously a lot of work to get to that point to be playing in the NHL, but um, having the opportunity coming up, it's, it's really exciting and that's something I'm going to push towards to, you know, get there and, uh, pretty soon, hopefully. How nervous does this whole thing make you? Because you seem pretty collected. You're, you're talking like you've done thousands and thousands of interviews. you got the language down already. <laughs> yeah. Anything freak you out about this? Not really. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's a very overwhelming couple of weeks. I think leading up to the draft and then being in Vancouver, going to development camp right after, it's, uh, it's pretty crazy. I think... Um, you are not really being nervous, but just, just trying to trying to stay calm through it all. You know, it's it's um, it's a crazy couple of weeks, and, and to be able to just kind of enjoy it, sit back, and and really uh, reflect on, on what's happening now, it's uh, it's uh, it's crazy. Yeah. Now, before you progress with the Colorado Avalanche, you still have to go to school, right? Yeah, You're still a student. Yeah, yeah, I'm headed to Boston College next year for um, you know for next year definitely, and then we'll see how it goes every year after that. All right. And when do you think things get really real for you? as far as uh, this team goes and you playing for them? Yeah, I mean, you know, my personal goals are to be playing, you know, in their organization in, in the next few years. Um, you know, obviously going to school is something that I've been pretty set on since I started uh, started out. So um, to be able to go there and, and, um, and start off at Boston College next year, it's exciting and um, take it year by year, but, but try to, you know, get to that point as soon as I can. Okay. Well, listen, uh, all the best on the whole province. Very proud of you and uh, good luck. Thank you very much. Well, sticking with hockey, but on the other end of a hockey career, St. John's own Colin Greening is hanging up his skates after 10 years of pro hockey and heading back to school. Greening was drafted in the seventh round by the Ottawa Senators in 2005, playing with them and their AHL farm team. He told CBC News he would have started the season in the AHL and that it would be a hard road back to the big league, so he decided to retire. Greening is heading to Harvard University in the fall and will pursue an MBA. He hopes to get into the sports management business, helping other young hockey players plan out their lives after hockey. The circus is here. A local film about performing with the circus in Northern Labrador airs tomorrow night on CBC Television. We'll talk to the director coming up next.
Well, welcome back to Here and Now. A new documentary follows circus performers as they visit students in Nunatsiavut on the north coast of Labrador. I saw a big old camera in the gym and I was like, the circus is here. Wonderbolt Circus brings unicycles and spinning plates and color and fun to children in the communities of Rigolette and Kovic, teaching the students new skills, all the while forming a cultural bond with freedom of expression at its core. And joining me now is Ruth Lawrence, the director of the documentary Circus by Comatic. So Ruth, uh, what drew Wonderbolt Circus to the North to begin with? Well, Carol, and thanks for having us in to talk about this documentary tonight. Uh, what drew us. About 25 years ago, maybe even longer, uh, Benny Malone and his circus, Wonderbolt Circus, started moving northwards up into Labrador to tour. Benny always did world touring as part of his programming with his uh, theatre company. And he started going up north and really discovering a real kinship uh, with the kids there and circus. What we started to notice was that the kids really had a lot of stories and legends that we felt could be explored using circus arts. So as part of this physical arts curriculum that we've been teaching up there for the last decade, uh, just little by little, over time, we started kind of collecting these stories from the kids. And then we went back and said, you know, this is ripe for creating a, a show of their own, like that they create. So that was actually what spurned this whole thing. Once we started into that pro process, working with the kids in Riggle at first and then Makovic, we realized that there was always something there. And so then Marion White, Benny's wife, who's also a film producer, said, we should be documenting this. This is really special. And so as a filmmaker myself, I said, yeah, I'll, I'll come on in with you. So I actually simultaneously helped teach the program with Benny, helped the kids create their show, and also directed the documentary. So they learned these new skills, and then at the end of it, there was a big show where they got to showcase all of their new skills. What was that like? It was amazing because we could not believe how fast the kids picked up the, the circus skills. They're so agile and just amazingly, they would pick up like things like the unicycle that took, you know, some of us weeks to learn. Well, so uh, times, they would pick it up and in a day, nothing, just through, through sheer determination and trial and error, and they'd pick up a unicycle and by the end of the day, some of them would be like going around the gymnasium, which we could not believe. So that was really interesting for us and really exciting. Mm -hmm. So we knew, okay, yes, this is like a two week process we knew that we could actually get them to show level. The first week was teaching them the skills, and then they did a skills presentation. The next time we went back, uh, we actually created the show that in the documentary you'll see the kids of Rigolette actually perform one based on legends drawn from their own community and their own culture. And how did the community as a whole react to it that? Was amazing there was so much support like Brad Gover and I who was uh, the cinematographer we would be out in the community sort of taking you know the foot the the, the footage of, of, of the scenery and just the community life there and people were so willing to come on board and let us kind of peek in on their daily lives and then I think it also built kind of a curiosity through that week so by the time it came for the kids to perform these shows Everyone came out, and again, like you can see the crowds in the gymnasium. Everyone came out to see what their kids or their grandkids or even their neighbors' kids were doing, and it was pretty amazing. The, the impact that that had on the children was really astonishing to see because they were just so proud of themselves, and, and knowing that it was a story of their own telling, I think, made it even more special. Um, well, thank you so much for telling us about it. Sounds like a lovely documentary. Don't miss it. It's going to be <laughs> fantastic. Thanks. And you can watch Circus by Comatic tomorrow at 7 p.m. Newfoundland time on CBC Television. And it'll be available anytime on CBC Gem, the CBC's streaming app. We're at the Perchance Outdoor Theater in Cupids, where we're about to learn why it is important for food placement at the, the uh, <laughs> watching the servant of two masters.
We talked about the heat uh, that's headed our way as we head through the day tomorrow. We'll take a look at the current temperatures that are over the Maritime Provinces. That is what's headed our way. Uh, 25 degrees right now in Montreal. Uh, a little bit more humid and uh, hot in Halifax. But we are going to see these temperatures move in as we head through the day tomorrow. Uh, here's what you're looking at. So 23 to as much as 30 degrees for parts of Central. Grand Falls, Windsor, looking at that. Again, I have that risk slight risk of some uh, afternoon lightning potentially if that does develop but plenty of sunshine for st john's 24 degrees and then again that risk of thunderstorms for happy valley goose bay as well 23 for you and then lab city sitting at 17. now that uh, mild air is going to continue as we head through the day on sunday uh, now that cold front will move in it will cool those temperatures down but it does look like things will stay nice and clear through the afternoon for most of the island, except uh, a little bit more unsettled up through Labrador. So here's a look at your temperatures for Sunday. We're looking at, uh, like I said, a little bit cooler. Uh, temperatures sitting around uh, 22 degrees for Grand Falls, Windsor. And then we're going to see similar temperatures still for St. John's. Uh, Port of Basque sitting at 18 degrees for your Sunday. Plenty of sunshine for Corner Brook and then the Straits sitting at uh, 15 degrees happy valley goose bay a little bit cooler as well so you're going to dip down to about 13 degrees so overall not a bad weekend again very hot humid so make sure that you have your sunscreen on and stay very hydrated uh, through the afternoon but uh mentioned a little bit earlier that we're here at the perchance theater and the reason for that is because we want to see a little bit of what you're going to see starting july 20th so here take a look We got you everything, everything. Uh, you give me half an hour, I can give you any kind of supper that you want. Steadily. Tell us what you can give us. Well, now, for two persons, two courses, I figure I can give you four dishes each. How's that? Oh, four dishes. They said five or six. Mm. That'll make it six or eight. That'll do. Now, All right. tell me what you can do first. Well, now, for the first course, mm. I think I can give you, I think I can give you the soup. The soup. Then the fried. Oh, then the boiled. Oh, then le fricando. Three of the dishes I know, but I do not know the last. What's that? Oh, le fricando. It's a French dish. It's a ragu, my son. It's wicked. That will do very well indeed. Well, that's good for the first course. Now, uh, what about the second? For the second course. The second course. I think we'll have a roast. <laughs> and then... A salad. <laughs> and then... A meat pie, <laughs> and then for dessert, a pudding. What's this another one? I don't know. What's this pudding? No, uh, I, I said pudding, not pudding. It's a, it's it's an English dish. Oh, son, it's delicate. Well, very good. But now, how are we going to have the table laid? Well, uh, that's the easy part. I usually just you know let the waiter take care of that. No, sir, it's a very important matter. That's the first thing about any good supper, having the table laid a properly. All right, all right, all right. So if you know if it was up to me, yeah. I would say we put the soup here, soup. the fry there, right. the boil there, right. and then the fricando here. No, 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 sure. You gotta have something in the middle. Oh, oh, you, you want five dishes? Yes, I want five dishes. Five dishes. dishes. All right, all right. Uh, we can put the dressing and the gravy right in the middle. Hang on. Oh, no, you don't put the gravy in the middle. Soup always goes in the middle. Well, we, we, we can put the meat on the one side and, and the gravy here on the other side. <laughs> oh, my friend. You may know how to cook, but you don't know a thing about butler. All right, here, look, I'll show you. Mm -hmm. Just say this is the table now. Yeah. Now we'll look at how to arrange the five dishes. Here in the middle is the soup. So there you go, a little bit of fun uh, in store. Again, this opens on July 20th. If you need any tickets, you can go to uh, perchancetheater.com and you can grab those. And that's it for us over here. And uh, hopefully you enjoy your weekend. Good night, Ash. Thanks, Ashley. Well, turning now to some national news, three earthquakes struck off the British Columbia coast this morning within minutes of each other. They measured between 4.5 and 5.6 in magnitude. 
The tremors were aftershocks of a stronger quake that hit the same area on Wednesday. None of them posed a tsunami threat. Just yesterday, the strongest earthquake to hit Southern California in 20 years struck the Mojave Desert, causing some people to wonder if the quakes in BC were related. West coast of the Americas has a uh a lot of faults along it, uh, various, various different types of faults, and um, there are actually quite a, uh, it's, it's, there's quite an elaborate fault system in between the ones that have happened up here in Canada and those that happened in California. They're not related, um, they're just coincidental that they happened in the same week. To Africa now, the leaders of Sudan's pro-democracy movement have reached a power-sharing deal with the country's military, and that had people actually celebrating today in the streets of the capital, Khartoum. Supporters of opposition groups call this a victory for their revolution. Longtime President Omar al-Bashir was thrown out of office by the military back in April. Pro-democracy protesters stayed in the streets demanding that the generals give up power. This new deal, though, will see a joint council made up of members from both sides and a timetable for a return to complete civilian rule. Welcome back to Here and Now. It's Friday. It's Friday. You know what that means. Mm -hmm. Time to find out who's celebrating birthdays and anniversaries. Happy 91st birthday to Emma Boone from Seldom, Fogo Island, now living in Labrador City. She celebrated yesterday. Happy birthday to Earl Parrott. He's turning 94. Happiest of birthdays to Mary Louise Cluett of Garnish, now living in Grand Bank. She will turn 103 on July 8th. Congratulations and best wishes to Vera Cashin on her 92nd birthday today. She's living in Carboneer. 
Birthday greetings to Eileen Wells from Glovertown, who turned 92 on July 3rd. And a happy 52nd anniversary to Roland and Ellie Studley in Labrador City. They celebrated on June 29th. And wishing Eliezer and Margaret Han of Stephenville a happy 69th wedding anniversary. They now live in Glovertown. Big day was on June 30th. Happy anniversary to Morley and Marie Inkpen from Buren. They celebrated 50 years of marriage on June 28th. Also, happy 50th wedding anniversary to Wince and Judy Wiltshire of Cornerbrook. They celebrated on June 20th. And yet another golden anniversary, happy 50th to John and Elaine Spurl of Hodges Cove. They celebrated yesterday. Congratulations and best wishes to Gordon and Bessie Bartlett of Kippens, who celebrated their 65th wedding anniversary on July 2nd. Wishing Maurice and Jean Knott of Norris Point a happy 54th anniversary. They celebrated on July 1st. Best wishes to Wallace and Ivy Wheeler, who celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary on July 2nd. Happy 70th anniversary on July 9th to Mary and Gordon Hodder of Lewisport. Gordon celebrates his 91st birthday on July 12th, and Mary celebrates her 93rd birthday on July 14th. So happy birthday, too. And happy anniversary to George and Betty Badcock of Gambo. They celebrated 50 years of marriage yesterday. And happy 57th wedding anniversary to Nellie and Bill Jennings of Fox Trap. They're celebrating on Saturday, July the 6th. And happy anniversary to Gerald and Bertha Payne in Cornerbrook on their 68th anniversary. Congratulations to Alexander, better known as Sandy and Netta Jones of Indian Bay, who celebrated their 61st wedding anniversary on June 30th. And a happy 93rd birthday to Violet Goodwin, who celebrated on July 2nd. She's from New Melbourne, Trinity Bay, and now lives in Winterton. And happy birthday to Grace Roberts, who is celebrating her 95th birthday today. Happy 92nd birthday to Mita Watkins of Cottlesville, now living in Lewisport. She celebrated June 24th. Happy 94th birthday to Mildred Canning of Comfort Cove Newstead, now living in Lewisport. Happy 50th wedding anniversary to Edward and Catherine Rogers from Kippins. They celebrated yesterday. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Charlie and Cicely Drodge of Clarenville. Also celebrating 50 years today are Melvin and Linda Earl of St. John's. Congratulations. Fred and Blanche Thorne of Burnt Islands celebrated their 50th anniversary yesterday. Congratulations. Happy 50th wedding anniversary also to Hugh and Elsie Fudge of Carboneer. They celebrated on Thursday. Best wishes to Margaret and Wilfred Crocker in Mount Pearl who are also celebrating their golden anniversary. And a happy 50th anniversary as well to Carl and Annie Lush of Burlington. Keith and Catherine Piercy of Cornerbrook are also celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary today. Happy 62nd anniversary to Garf and Mary Tiller of Cornerbrook. They will celebrate on July 8th. Congratulations to Margaret and Graham Hillier of St. John's on their 64th wedding anniversary on July 4th. Milligan and Violet Chapel of Virgin Arm are celebrating their 64th wedding anniversary today. Congratulations. Happy 50th anniversary to Nathan and Donna Lear in Pasadena. Happy 50th wedding anniversary today to Kaywood and Dora Rideout of Cornerbrook. Congratulations to Lucy and Alonzo Stride of Lewisport who are celebrating their 51st wedding anniversary tomorrow. And a happy 50th wedding anniversary to Clyde and Barbara George from Kelligrews. And happy 57th anniversary to Paul and Gwen Hollett of Epworth. And best wishes to Shirley and Lloyd Banfield of Ochre Pit Cove. They celebrated their 51st anniversary yesterday. And a happy 50th anniversary to Roy and Rowena Wareham of Arnold's Cove. They also celebrated yesterday. Happy 50th anniversary to Mont and Sadie Keough of Kilbride, who celebrated on June 28th. Congratulations to Lorne and Verna Moss of Eastport. They're celebrating 62 years of marriage today. Happy 60th anniversary to Majors Edgar and Wavy Penny in Mount Pearl. They celebrated on July 3rd. And happy 50th anniversary to Maynard and Minnie King of St. John's. They will celebrate on July 10th. Fine crowd. Yeah, congratulations, everybody. Yeah. Well, it's not quite a Noah's Ark. No, but it is the world's first floating dairy farm. Okay. Yes, a <laughs> floating dairy farm. It's in the Netherlands, and it's actually able to weather a mild flood. Hmm. This is also creating new land, but then completely floating. 
So we're creating new landscapes on the water. This unique barn with a sea view is home to 32 cows and is always on the Move. Oh, come on. Sorry. <laughs> the largely self-contained facility processes dairy products on site and it's designed to desalinate seawater and is powered by a large array of solar panels. And with the Netherlands uh, prone to uh, flooding and rising sea levels, it's hoped that these kinds of floating structures can offer an alternative to traditional farming. And also having a movable, floatable farm also means that it can supply fresh food to cities that are on nearby rivers and uh, that are near rivers rather and uh, waterways. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. Well, the Calgary Stampede is out of the shoot for the 107th time. The annual Stampede Parade marks the start of the big 10 day event, which still bills itself as the greatest outdoor show on earth. The parade features more than 100 entries, including 32 floats and 19 bands from across Canada and around the world. Mm. This year's parade marshal is Amber Marshall from CBC's Heartland. More than 150,000 people lined the five kilometer route through downtown Calgary for last year's parade. Quite the scene. Yeah. I have some uh, family members who now call Calgary home who moved from Newfoundland, like a lot of Newfoundlanders moving to Alberta. Yeah. And uh, it's huge. Yeah. I've never been. I've never been yeah. either. I would like to see it. Yeah. Get a cowboy hat. And Do you want a cowboy hat? Yeah. Okay. I wouldn't mind. <laughs> Note to self. <laughs> Amazon. Okay, there you go. What color? Any color would you like? Uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> White is good. White is good. Black Maybe like a big red. feather. No, they don't have yeah. feathers. Never mind. Any weekend plans? Any bees? Uh, Any? No, no bees this no. weekend. I have a stagette this weekend, actually. A stagette? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Oh, stay tuned for Monday. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. How about you? Uh, get, out, uh, get outdoors. Get listening to uh, Ashley's forecast. It's going to be a beautiful, real start of summer, it sounds like, tomorrow. Mm. Got to get outside, maybe go for a hike around the ocean. Some fishing, maybe. Oh, the food I'd fishery. love to. I'd love yeah. to. That's right. That's on. Yeah, that's on just tomorrow. Just need to find some fish. So send me your tweets. Where are the cod to? <laughs> Hope you have a great weekend. Good night, everyone.